Well, good morning and welcome come again to this Saturday morning mixture of fun and faith, of the efficacious to the goodness gracious, of the, would you credit that, to the, would you credit that, from the wonderful to the blunderful, it's Tea in the Hall. We have a Tea in the Hall special today, focusing on miners and mining. In commemoration of the remembrance of the Nixinich disaster and rescue, which was 70 years ago this Monday, the 7th of September. So we give pride of place to our friend Bobby Guthrie, who is going to talk us through the days and events surrounding the Nukshinich disaster and rescue. Hello, Bobby Guthrie here from my home in Barhead. Thank you again for the invitation to join Tea in the Hall. Today I'd like to talk about the Nukshinich disaster and rescue to mark the 70th anniversary of that unforgettable event in Newcomnock's history. Nukshinich Castle Colliery was sunk in 1939 by Newcomnock Collieries Limited, and it was one of the most modern mechanised bits in Scotland at the time. It remained under their control until 1947, when the coal industry was nationalised throughout Britain on the 1st of January of that year. By 1950, it was producing 5,000 tonnes per week. And employed 600 people underground and 120 in the pit head. So if you look at a map of the area from not long after the disaster happened, at the centre you can see the fairly unremarkable Nukshinak Hill. The name is Gaelic in origin, meaning Hill of the Fox. It sits between the Conal Burn in the west and the Afton Water in the east. If you look at the top left hand corner now you can see KT which is the site of a uh, Nukshinak Tower which was home to the Dunbars of Nukshinak from the, the 15th century. That was later replaced by Nukshinak Farm in the 18th century and the farm still stands there to this day. And then we can see Nukshinak Castle Colliery adjacent to the site of the tower it takes its name from. The red arrow shows the route of the number five heading where the coal was been worked and there uh, the symbol of the crater that was created after the inrush of liquid peat. And added to the map uh, is the site of uh, the much later memorial. Here we are, and uh, last day of August in 1950, heavy rain most of the week, 
and you can see the workings of the heading number 5 heading towards the surface. It started off the 1 and 4 gradient and probably nearer 1 and 2 by, by, by the time it reached uh, here. There'd been water running down number 5 heading, giving some concern with some boulders coming uh, down as well. Uh, and the field above the 5 was surveyed. And they found there was only 38 feet between the heading roof and the surface. It was a wee bit soggy underfoot and appeared ordinary soil with nice green grass on it. Forward now to Thursday the 7th of September 1950. The heavy rain in Newcomnock had continued and at 6.30 that evening there was a large fall at the face of the number 5 heading. Inspection of the field above revealed some subsidence and that area was fenced off. However, the nice green grass was concealing a hidden danger, for below it lay a lake of liquid peat or moss. Regrettably, although the map of the area held centrally indicated the presence of moss, the map held it and Shinnok did not. At half past seven, the lake unleashed a vortex of some 60,000 tonnes of liquid sludge down the heading at a great force destroying equipment and machinery and anything that got in its way. This aerial image taken the following day reveals the extent of the inrush and can only conjure up images of the disaster unfolding below. On the right hand side is a map of the workings of Nakshina Castle Colliery. Here you can see the number 5 heading with an image of the crater and the X marking the spot of the inrush of peat. Thirteen men were working in this area of the pit when the inrush occurred and the initial searches, hampered by the sludge, failed to locate them. Meanwhile, news of the scale of the inrush was communicated to the other 116 men working down the pit. Under the leadership of Overman Andrew Houston, they congregated at the West Main Station but thankfully the telephone contact to the surface remained intact. Houston was able to explain that they were all trapped with no means of escape and also sadly confirmed 13 men were missing. At the surface it was recalled that in order to improve the drainage in Nakshinak, a new road was driven into the abandoned bank number 6 workings and progressed to within 24 feet of the nearest bank tunnel. A barricade of rock, earth and coal separated the two and a small borehole was drilled to drain off any water from the Nakshinak side. The plan was now to fashion an escape for the 116 men by means of a rescue hole at this point. News of the extent of the disaster was conveyed to the NCB officials and mine workers union and to the outside world. Nakshinak would be on the front pages of newspapers across the land and beyond. The main rescue brigades, volunteers, local and fire, emergency services were all mobilised. A preliminary check of the bank number six workings was carried out. While Andrew Houston was instructed to have the barrier checked from the Nakshinak side and share the news with his men. The rescue plan illustrates the routes to the barricade. The green route shows the route taken by Houston and a party of his men via the Waterhead Duke to reach the barricade, while the blue route shows the rescue brigade entry into the bank number six workings as they prepare to encounter the deadly fire damp gas in the abandoned works. Powerful fans were taken in order to establish a main fresh air base and an advanced fresh air base. The photo on the right shows the rescue men entering bank number 6 and hutches with an electric fan in the front hutch. Now into early Friday morning and as expected bank number 6 was full of fire damp gas. By noon 300 feet of the gas had been cleared. From 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock, a stupendous effort was made to install more powerful fans 
However, worryingly, no real progress was made in clearing the gas. The photo shows an anxious crowd of, no doubt, family, friends and colleagues of the trapped and missing men at the entry to the bank workings. At 3pm, Houston and his men were given clearance to start digging a hole through the barricade, taking turns in small teams. At 10.45pm that evening, rescuers and miners hold through the barricade together. The miners were then instructed to begin widening the hole with caution. Fire damp in the bank side remained a big problem. There were also concerns that the airflow may change direction, with fire damp flowing through from bank to Nakshara. The photo shows rescue worker Simon Grant of the Kirkconnell rescue team being stretched out of the bank number 6 in the early hours of Saturday the 9th of September. No doubt increasing the anxiety levels of those waiting at the pit head for their loved ones. There was good news on the Saturday morning with the delivery of food and drink delivered to the trapped men, but this soon changed when the news that fire damp had been detected in the Waterhead Duke and the Nakshinak side. Morale was then boosted when local man Dave Park, now Deputy Labour Director in the NCB Scotland, joined the trapped men and would remain with them throughout. These images from the bank, number six pit head, show family, friends and colleagues waiting anxiously for news, any news, of the trapped and missing men. The fire damp in bank number six was stubbornly not for shifting and time was not on the side of the trapped miners. Dave Park had called for a change of plan in terms of the breathing apparatus that would be used to escort out the miners promoting the use of the less cumbersome salvage equipment, although it had not been approved for use underground. His demands were met and a call went across the line from fire stations in particular to send this type of equipment to Nakshina. The sense of urgency intensified as gas was now detected near to the West Main Telephone Station. Further concern when at 12.45 in the Saturday afternoon one of the younger miners had taken a turn for the worse and required to be stretched out. An act of bravery with the rescue teams which took two hours to complete. At 5pm on Saturday the 19th of September the plan was now finalised with chains of rescue brigade men set up in both the bank and the Chinook side. The first act was to forward the salvage equipment to the trap men. Andrew Houston then established a rota for the 116 men to be taken out in groups of three via the chains of the rescue workers. Houston's rota has survived and is shown here. At 5.20 in the afternoon of Saturday 9th of September 1950, almost two days since the inrush at the number five heading, the evacuation of 116 trap miners began. And at 6.07pm the first group were greeted with great cheers at the pit head of the bank number six. Some seven hours later and five minutes into Sunday morning, the last of the 116 men emerged from the darkness into the light. Soon after, Dave Park joined them. This had been a remarkable rescue. 116 lives saved that once were feared to be lost. 20 rescue brigades involved, six brigades constantly in the danger zone at one time, and the Coke Bridge rescue team remained in the Nakshinak side throughout evacuation. Andrew Houston was still in demand and returned to the scene of the inrush to indicate where the 13 missing men had been working. It became clear that any survivors could not be reached via the route through the bank number six workings. Exploring parties then accessed the number five heading but the crater was still in a very dangerous state. 
on Monday 11th of September any hopes of reaching the missing men alive were given up. Those missing men were John D.L., James Houston, Thomas Houston, William Howitt, William Lee, James Love, William McFarlane, John McClatchy, Samuel Rowan, John Smith, Daniel Strachan, John Taylor and John White. The survivors were taken to Balakmyo Hospital near Mochlin for checkovers and soon released home. And a week later many of them enjoyed a trip to Butlins at Air. Tragically, there had been other loss of life during the Nakshanak disaster. Hugh Blackwood volunteered to help dig ditches to divert the water away from the crater. After a hard day's work, he headed for his home in nearby Arthen Road, but sadly collapsed and died, and now lies in the Arthen Cemetery. Members of the Salvation Army had been in attendance from the first news of the disaster. These included five Salvationists from Sokuts who travelled back and forth each day. Tragically, on returning home on the Sunday morning, their car was involved in a crash and driver Arthur Morris was killed at the scene, while his fiancée Iris Wiley later died in the hospital of her injuries. They lie together in Addressing Cemetery. A service of divine worship was held at Martyrs Kirk in Newcomnock on Sunday the 17th of September 1950. The officiating ministers were the Right Reverend Hugh Watt, moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Reverend Hardy, Secretary of the Scottish Baptist Union, and the Reverend Stuart, moderator of the Presbyterian. Of course, our local ministers were there, the Reverend Lowry from the Arthur Memorial, the Reverend Morgan for the Baptist Kirk, the Reverend Buchanan for the Bank Kirk, and the Reverend Law for the Martyrs Kirk. The Reverend Law proceeded throughout the service. The bodies of the 13 Nakshinak missing men were recovered the following year, over a period from January to July 1951, and buried at the Afton Cemetery, overlooking the scene of the disaster in the Nakshinak pit bing. Volunteers from the Newcomnock Community Council, with support from local sponsors, established the Nakshinak Commemorative Cairn, a short distance from the site of the Nakshinak Crater. Two cairns sit within the paved enclosure. The number 13 formed by 13 red flagstones surrounded by 116 yellow flagstones. An annual Nakshinak Memorial Service has been held here for a number of years now. Thank you for letting me be part of Tea in the Hall again. I really appreciate it. The Nashinak Disaster and Rescue remains a huge part of our coal mining heritage and Newcomnock's history. By its very nature, today's presentation has been longer than usual and thank you if you've managed to stay till the end. I nearly didn't as my voice is almost gone. Enjoy your tea. Curidun, 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 my darling, curidun, my dear, curidun, 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 my darling, curidun.
So we make her milk, her meal, her fire, and her lamp. Goody doon, goody doon, goody doon, my darling. Goody doon, my dear. Your daddy's house. Your daddy's hugging, call my darling, for his in we win. Goody doon, goody doon, goody doon, my darling, goody doon, my dear. Your daddy. Thank you, Bobby, for reminding us so well, as always, of the events that surrounded the Nuxchinich disaster and rescue. A story that's obviously ingrained into the history of Newcomnock, but a story too that's inspirational in how the people then responded to such a great tragedy. And thanks too to our friends from Sankar, Victoria and Rowan Hasty for that lovely rendition of Kuri Doon. And now time for our wee grey cells to come into action. And it's quiz time. And we have a, a mixed bag this morning. Not of uh, uh, calls, but of questions. Mm, there are a few mining questions in there. And some music maybe from... Uh, the Nuxinach era, the 50s, 60s, through to 80s and beyond. So here we go, question number one. For which Australian pop group was the carnival over? For which Australian pop group was the carnival over? And the answer is The Seekers. Question two. Which pop group was known as the Fab Four. Which pop group was known as the Fab Four? And it's the Beatles. Question number three. What was Elvis's first British top ten hit in May 1956? What was Elvis's first British top ten hit in May 1956? And the answer is... Heartbreak Hotel. Question number four. Which comic rode his funky moped to number five in 1975? Which comic rode his funky moped to number five in 1975? And the answer is Jasper Carrot. Question number five. Who was going to make you a star in 1994? Who was going to make you a star in 1994? And the answer is David Essex. Question number six. 
Name Phil Collins' first single after leaving Genesis. Name Phil Collins' first single after leaving Genesis. And the answer is In the Air Tonight. Question number seven. Apart from coal, name one other element mined in Newcomb Apart from coal, name one other element mined in Newcomb And the answer could have been lead or antimony. Question eight. Which crooner was named or nicknamed Old Blue Eyes? Which crooner was nicknamed Old Blue Eyes? And the answer is Frank Sinatra. Question nine. Who were known on TV as the Two Ronnies? Who were known on TV as the Two Ronnies? Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett. Question 10. What colour was the Incredible Hulk when he made his debut in 1962? What colour was the Incredible Hulk when he made his debut in 1962? And the answer is grey. Question 11. Who wrote the classic children's book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Question 11. Who wrote the classic children's book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? And the answer is Roald Dahl. Question 12. In 1943, Britain's Bevan boys were called to work in which industry? In 1943, Britain's Bevan boys were called to work in which industry? And the answer is mining. Question 13. Who's missing? Dave D. Dozy. Something. Mick and Titch. Who's missing? Dave D. Dozy. Something. Mick and Titch. And the answer is Beaky. Question 14. Silence proved golden for which group in 1967? Silence proved golden for which group in 1967? And the answer is the Tremolos. Question 15. What military parade is held in London on the Sovereign's official birthday? What military parade is held in London on the Sovereign's official birthday? And the answer is the Trooping of the Colour. Question 16. What birds were used in mines to detect dangerous gases? What birds were used in mines to detect dangerous gases? And the answer is canaries. Question 17. What do we call the person who sets off the explosions in a mine? What do we call the person who sets off the explosions in a mine? And the answer is shot fired. And the last question, question 18. What is a compressed block of coal dust called? What is a compressed block of coal dust called? And the answer is a bricket. Okay, well done. If you scored 15 or more, you deserve a star. And thank you to Mary McCormack for uh, making up the large part of that quiz. Thank you, Mary. Brass bands and silver bands are very much associated, as, as we know, with uh, mining and miners. Um, I don't know if that's how uh, Sanker Silver Band um, came to be, 
but I think it's very appropriate that we have some brass band music and it's going to be played for us by Morag Ferens, accompanied by Christine Wilson. They have chosen to play of their first two pieces the hymn The Old Ragged Cross, which was the hymn that was sung by the miners who were trapped underground at Nuxinach. Thank you to Morag and Christy. We'll hear from them later. And now we hear from Lottie, who has a poem about mining written by a miner. Nuxinach, of course, gives its name to many things, um, to the mine, to the disaster and rescue, and also nowadays to the lagoons, a place built on uh, shale uh, of a pit bing and now associated with a beautiful woodland walk and nature reserve. A place of peace, a place of beauty, a place where our soul can be still.
And now we hear from Lottie, who has a poem about miners, written by one of the Durham miners. This poem was written by a Durham worker, Bob Richardson. It's called The Mine Worker. They have no workers' playtime, no music while you work. There is but long, hard labour that all but heroes shirk. Yes, a miner is a hero and should no doubt my word. Let me mention just one danger, though of many you'll have heard. Have you ever sat in the gleam of a lamp and heard the timbers creak, like hinges of the gates of hell, and you dare not move or speak? Have you ever lain in a confined space with a constant water flow, a broken roof above your head, a sodden floor below? Have you heard the voice of tortured strata as earth gives threatening growls, the puny, helpless humans hacking at her bowels? Have you watched a comrade dying as the rocks have crushed his frame, praying for the sunlight he'll never see again? As it's easy to die with the sun in your face while the gifts of God surround you, to lie alone in the slime and dust without a friend beside you. Oh, when you speak of heroes and speak of them with pride, give some thought to the miners and those of them who died. They get no place in history, no glory for their deeds. Britain gained her national pride because of men like these. What do you get if you push a piano down a mine shaft? A flat miner. What do you call a lump of coal and a diamond hanging out together? Carbon dating. Did you hear about the man who started a job as a miner last week? But he had to leave as he was lightheaded. When I came to Newcomnock at first, I was astounded by the number of hairdressers. I've already done that. I was also astounded by the number of people who had been in the past clippies. And I couldn't quite work it out. Except when people told me the number of buses that were needed to take all the miners from the village to the various mines round about. So we're going to hear from and about a clippy. So, what did you do when you were 18? You picked up your bag and your ticket machine. By that black skirt and jacket you didn't look half smart. But did you have rollers under your hat? Yes, I wanted always to be a bus conductress. To wait till you were 18 till you became a conductress. So I'd worked at the plastic factory for three years. So I was 18 on the Saturday and I started the buses on the Monday. So you went into what you called the office and you were given your ticket machine and your, all your tickets. And then you got an, a box, a tin box that held all your tickets and spare ones. So then I proceeded to go down into what you call the mess room where all the conductresses were. So I opened this door and of course all the faces just looked at me. So I just said, where can I put this box? Well I was told in no uncertain manner where that box went. And that was quite funny. But then another morning when we were always started our work early because the pit started early so we had to be down early to get into the bus but this morning one of the girls opened the door for the mess room and all of a sudden this wee moose was running about so this girl just went pop, pop, pop. Aye, and the poor mouse was dead so the, de the mouse got flung out the the window, so there were no a mouse no more. So then later on, 
when you got onto your bus, it was this by this time some of the buses didn't have any doors on them. So when it was snowing, the snow used to swirl round about your feet because the buses were always busy because of the miners and there were so many of them that the conductors had to stand there. But Huntington, it wasn't long, but the buses were very cold. So in these days, it's not as comfortable as what it is now, but we all enjoyed it because we liked to chat and that's why I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the buses to get chatting to the passengers. A lot of them as factory workers and some of them, yes, were rough, but when you got to know them, they weren't really as rough as they made out to be. They all were to ourselves, they all had problems and we always sometimes shared with one another and that's what I did like to do. Even then, was just shared to try to help one another. So, this morning when we started it, we would go, we'd get the bus at half past four and we'd, the bus went up Lime Road and it picked up, supposed to be two, two sisters, but there was only one come on. So we, the bus went up to Great Breeze and down Blairine and down Dalhanna Drive and down into the main road where we were picked up. And we said, where's Jessie? And Margaret looked out the back and she says, she's running down the road knowing her clothes just now. She will learn to get up when I tell her. So obviously Jessie, to that day, I don't think it was ever late. Mm -hmm. So it was a good place to work at because you get talking to many people. And that's what I liked about the buses. They're They're and when we had a uniform on a Friday night, we used to go to a late dance. And there was an inspector, inspector who would book you if you had rollers in your hair. But he never ever knew because we kept them in below our hat with three at the top and four, four at each side. And then we got it French combed and away we went to Ochen Lake dance after we got finished the back of 11 o'clock. It was long days because you started at half four, but you would take the miners and the factory workers and the school children to the school and then you were, what you they call, you were booked off for about two to two and a half hours and then your next run would be, I went to air, beer or Bolton. But I enjoyed that so very, very much until all of a sudden the one-man buses come in. So we were put into the mess room and we didn't get out. I think they were trying to get rid of us to make us leave, but some we didn't. But one of the times when we were in the mess room at that time, I was had a friend called Sandra Shearer. And Sandra Shearer and I had drunk a bottle of what you call Farm's Dram, which I've never ever seen again in my life. But I can assure you, the Farm's Dram put me off drinking for a while. But there were good days, and it was good to share with people, with people in the buses, because we were all a happy crowd. And we did like getting on with the public, but it was also a hard time too. So that was my, some of my stories, some of them I won't be telling, I'll just keep them in below my heart. And now we hear from Morag again as she plays what is known as the Miner's Hymn to the tune Gresford. Uh, Gresford was um, the site of another mining disaster at the Gresford Colliery in Wrexham County Borough in North East Wales. Although it's called a hymn, there are actually no words written to it, perhaps because no words are necessary for God to hear the cry of our heart from the depths of despair.
Did you hear about the man digging for coal that wasn't allowed to buy a drink? Because he was a miner. Not a lot of people know this, but it wasn't for miners. Snowmen wouldn't be able to see, speak or smell. Not a lot of people know this, but Neil Diamond used to be called Neil Cole until the pressure got to him. Now a wee bit light-hearted song, um, it's not about mining, I, I couldn't find one, but this is related to Newcomnick's mining history, uh, because as we know, on the shale bings uh, in the Nukshanach lands, they landscaped what we now know as the lagoons, uh, a beautiful uh, area to, to be in and to walk in. So this song is called Gone Rune the Bing. New Cumnock Toon, it has lagoons, though they're no tropical. There's nae palm trees, nae coral seas, as far as we can tell. Nae balmy gentle breeze, exotic birds upon the wing. But who needs them? What made it him? Just go and run the bing. I go and run the bing, my friends, go and run the bing. Communing there with nature, there is no better thing. Walking, jogging, twitching, snapping, or even just on a run. What better thing could we be doing than go and run the bing? It is a hidden treasure, loads of folk don't ken it's there. They drive by castles, hills, rodents, headed for trun or air. But once it is discovered, then its praises they will sing, proclaiming the delights they fun and go and run the bang. I go and run the bang, my friends, go and run the bang. Communing there with nature, there is no greater thing. Walking, jogging, twitching, snapping, or even just on a end. What better thing could we be doing than go and run the bend? There's babes and prams and feathers arms. There's folk walking their dogs. Some picking up the litter, and there's feeding all the ducks. Some go there just to clear their heat. For some, it's a green gem. And I'm sure there's money a prayer prayed. When go and run the bang, I go and run the bang, my friends, go and run the bang. Come you in there with nature, 
there is no greater thing Walking, jogging, twitching, snapping Or even just on a run What better thing could we be doing Than going round the bay? It's ringing through with birds and bees And bunny butterflies There's fine strong birch and run And reed swaying in the breeze a panoply of broad white flowers Twould make a sad heart sing Just watch out for the midges When you're going round the bing I going round the bing, my friends Going round the bing Communing there with nature There is no greater thing Walking, jogging, twitching, snapping Or even just on a end What better thing could we be doing then go and run the bin. My great and birds, they love it, the wildlife folk they say. It's mud banks and wide waters, draw them in and make them stay. But maybe they flew a thousand miles to give Henry a wee ring and get themselves a takeaway for go and run the bin. I go and run the bang, my friends, go and run the bang. Communing there with nature, there is no greater thing. Walking, jogging, twitching, snapping, or even just on a run. What better thing could we be doing than go and run the bang? What better thing could we be doing than go and run the bang? Many thanks to everyone who took part in different ways today um, and please remember that there is a memorial service tomorrow, that's Sunday the 6th at 1 o'clock at the Nukshenich Memorial. There are very limited places, um, 20 uh, for places um, for the, the people who will be there at the service. Others can, can come. Um, as long as they're socially distanced. And on Monday, there will be a further memorial service at the Miner's Lamp at the castle. So please come along, um, being prepared, of course, to abide by the regulations, especially in terms of social distancing. And now we come to our wee friend, and the only thing that she has got to do with mining is that she is always a mine. Of completely useless information. Hello, it's me, the Reverend I, um, Julie. Call me Angelina. I've fair enjoyed the day. I've learnt a lot. And I think it's been a good time for folk to think about Nick Shinnick and what happened there. It's a big part in you come at folk's life. But I would like to tell you the day about my time as a prison chaplain. I bet you thought it was more like Charlie Chaplin than a prison chaplain. But I went there to cheer them up the same way I'm cheering you up. Because, as you know, prisoners are all lonely, for they're in their cells. But it was this one prisoner came to me. Oh, he was a repeat offender. Just couldn't get out the bit at all. And he had enough a sad story to tell me. His name was Ted. And there were three of them apparently in, a few years ago, the same bit of the jail. Tiny, Timmy and Ted. And they all decided that they would fin away out, so they all escaped. Tiny Timmy and Ted. And they got as far as the woods. And here the dogs were chasing them and catching up on them. Well, said Tiny, what we'll do is we'll scrum a tree, just take one tree each, and we'll make a wee noise like one of the animals. And then the dogs will not get us. 
So they asked on a tree. And the dogs came to the tree what time he was. And he said, or he said, Meow. Meow. And the dog thought, ugh, just a cat. Went to the next tree where Timmy was. And Timmy went, And the dog said, oh, it's just a bird. Then they got to the tree where Ted was. And he can't, he was to make the noise of an animal. So he went, moo. And that's who you get back in the jail. Well, that's all for me the day. Have a good week. Goodbye. God bless. Yeah.